Hello everyone and welcome back to our YouTube channel. I'm Sonia Trivedi, Communications Manager here at Moodle, and I have with me Sam Taylor, a Senior E-Learning Consultant at Catalyst IT Europe, a premium Moodle partner. Sam is a practice lead of pedagogy and community, and she's here to share her knowledge and expertise on the importance of learning design in e-learning solutions. Sam, welcome. Hi. Very nice to have you here. Firstly, you have an impressive title. If you had to explain that to someone who doesn't know what pedagogy is, can you please tell me more about it? What does it mean? So pedagogy in a nutshell is all about the science of teaching and learning. So the word pedagogy actually comes from the teaching of children. But in my world, we don't obviously just teach children, we teach adults, and that's a different science, so that's called andragogy. And then you've got the self-learning, the hoitagogy. But it basically means that um, I support our clients, I support our hosted clients, I support the community, I support ourselves internally on any uh, projects or work that involves supporting um, creation of content, creation of programs, looking at feedback from past runs of courses and making improvements to make sure that the learning is actually happening. Great, great. And do you have a team? I suppose you do. I, I work as um, you know, part of um, a team of consultants. So um, at Catalyst, my job is not part of the technical team. So at Catus, we do hosting um, for universities and NGOs, but in our team, it's more the business development side, supporting our clients and customers who have questions. Um, and it could also involve working with people who we don't host. So people can come to us on the back of a, um, a conference or they've seen us online or they've heard about us through word of mouth and um, they come to us and ask for help. So I work in a team with um, business development officers. I work with the sales team. We have a great digital marketing lead and I help write content for her. And I also work with the product specialists um, to help solve complex um, queries that come through our ticketing system. So why are the courses not completing? Why can't my students see this module? Why has the certificate not released? So it's quite a broad range and our team deal with all of that. Yes, I can imagine. Sounds like you guys are doing a great job, but I'm curious to know a little bit more about your customers. What kind of customers do you usually work with? So in the European office, so we are actually a global organization. We have um, offices in uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Um, but in the UK office and Europe, we deal with a lot of universities. So we host quite large universities like UCL, we host uh, Birkbeck, we host Bath University. So all these big universities that are very big Moodle users. Uh, over in Ireland as well, we look after Dublin City University, Maynooth and a couple of others. And um, we do the hosting for them. We support them with um, their upgrades and security, but also we do monthly meetings with our clients as well. So we look after those and uh, make sure that their platforms are always standing up they um, especially during exam periods or during the rush uh, in September when all the students log in and um, you know as well as them we also look after NGOs so we have some quite big uh, charities but also training organizations people that um, deliver apprenticeships or CPD training to teachers. Right okay and now talking about your customers, I am curious to ask you more about your own work and let's explore it in a bit more details. What have you been working on lately? Can you tell us more? Yeah, so um, so obviously you said my job title at the start was pedagogy and community. And I have to stress, um, you know, how much the Moodle community is part of my role as well. So um a lot of the stuff I've been doing with regards to pedagogy and learning design. So that would be working with clients to look at what they currently have and make improvements for the next year. So this could be from having a very customized, heavily developed, customized platform, which is obviously the beauty of open source. You can build all these custom things, but actually say, well, you know, the, the technology's moved on a lot now. There's a lot of core cool features that you could use instead. So it's looking at 
the whole platform and identifying new features and workarounds that doesn't involve development, which makes upgrades a lot quicker. And this is all the way scaled down to maybe some courses that a university has run. They've gathered student feedback and they want to put the feedback into action, but they don't know how or they don't have the time or they want to know what other universities are doing. So I've been doing a lot of work with creating content based on the back of uh, feedback from students. Other things I've been doing, um, so internally at Catalyst, uh, talk about the uh, community, I put on um, special show and tell talks between the teams. So um, the, I get the developers sharing um, some of the stuff that they've been doing with each other. So we call them our tech talks. We have them on a Wednesday and a dev will say, right, I've been working on SAML 2 integration. I say, right, do a 15 minute show and tell and I'll record it and share it. Um, but also I've been, um, getting involved in the community sort of joining uh, webinars and things like that so it's quite a broad range of stuff and i've been helping our business development teams write um and create content for uh, sales pitches and stuff so lots and lots of stuff <laughs> must be very exciting i um, love my job so much <laughs> amazing amazing but now i would like to request you to explain a little bit more more to our viewers the role of learning designers. Okay, so what is the role of learning designers in creating courses? What do they actually do? So with my learning designer hat on, so I design the um, the training materials for my colleagues here at, um, at Catalyst. So what I do is I work with the actual subject matter experts because it's very rare that a learning designer would be the subject matter experts. They're just responsible for getting the information out of the people that have all the knowledge. So what I would do is um, I would speak with them. I'd get all the key concepts that I want out of them. And then I start talking to them about, OK, so how, like, for example, with a developer, you know, how would you want them to demonstrate that they have these PHP skills that we want them to have? How could they? What sort of outputs do they do? And then you design the learning activity around that because at the end of the day the learning design you have to be able to measure a person's um, ability and skills against the job that they do um, so there's no point just giving them lots of information and then asking them to sit an exam at the end of the day because they don't do exams they demonstrate and this is where you can design the actual assessment to be maybe right here is a a, a brief go away come up with some responses to the questions, how you would do this in your situation, and then maybe present it back in a video or a working example. So the learning design, it's not just, here's the content, sit an exam. It's like, no, okay, so what is the context? And you build in throughout your design, small little assessment steps, just to make sure that they've understand the key concepts so that when it actually comes to the end and you're having to prove that you have finished the learning, that the skills that you've gathered can be demonstrated. And Moodle provides all the tools to be able to do that. Okay, okay. And going a little bit deeper into the topic, does it matter if you design for face-to-face -face instruction and learning environments? What are the difference? Do they have anything in common? Can you elaborate? Yeah, I mean, so they have a lot in common. And, um, you know, I have to stress that designing for online is very, very different to designing in for the classroom. Uh, a lot of this was made apparent um, during um, you know, the pandemic where the lockdown happened and everybody flipped to online delivery. And this is where um, tools like Moodle really came into their own because teachers and lecturers were getting very, very stressed. You know, we hear of this Zoom fatigue, um, the fact that you know, they were trying to deliver live content online and they were getting tired because they were just constantly broadcasting, broadcasting, broadcasting. What the online environment can facilitate is asynchronous learning, offline learning. So students can, go through the content they can answer questions they can gather their thoughts they can curate all their content and then when it comes to the live session that's when they can ask the questions of the experts that's when they can do more workshopping and in-depth thinking because they've got all the knowledge up front it's like um they, they try um there's this model called the flip classroom model for face-to-face -face teaching and that's where you ask your learners to go away read up 
gather information, gather questions, put together notes of, con of stuff that they didn't quite understand. And that's what gets addressed in the face-to-face -face sessions. And that's kind of like how the online learning environment can work and come, really comes into its own. But if you're designing purely for the classroom, you know, you can um, design these hybrid models of teaching, but in my experience, when you're delivering hybrid, hybrid sessions, design for online first because that, it still works in a face-to-face -face situation. But if you're designing for face-to-face, -face, it can be difficult to then try and deliver it online at the same time. So you do have to have a different approach for each one. Right. Okay. That's really interesting. And if you take as a case study, the digital learning content, digital educational content. Can you please elaborate a bit more why is learning design important, especially for digital learning environments? So it is important because a lot of people are really familiar with how to learn in a classroom. When you go online, it can be very, you, you have very different experiences. And so it's really important in your learning design that you have your signpost, you have your assessment points because you don't always have the instant feedback like you would do in a classroom. So for example, you know, your teacher is talking to you or your lecturer has designed like a, a you know, a desk based, you know, a, a table based activity group work. You are constantly getting feedback from your peers. You're constantly getting feedback from your teacher, but online, sometimes it can be quite lonely. So you have to structure these assessment points in, you have to structure these feed point points in and it's also with really good learning design it's about putting you the human into your content as well so it doesn't feel like a robot you're working with a robot but you're actually working with a real person so good learning design has um you know the feedback opportunities the um, assessment opportunities and it's also you've got to make sure that it's all accessible as well and uh, you know it's not just you know whether they need uh, tools to help them learn like screen readers or text-to-speech but it's also accessible like through different devices as well so they're very very different things but just making sure that the content is um you know able to be got at from multiple devices so when it comes to learning design you have to really structure it. you can't just upload a load of powerpoints and just say have at it kids it's a case of okay if i was a learner would i understand this how would i know i got it if i haven't got it who do i ask for help or how do I know that I'm progressing the same as my peers? Or how do I know that I am progressing? Where's the end? What do I have to do to finish? So these are all things that um, good learning design in the online space can really, really, really help people, especially if, you know, especially, well, definitely if you've been out of learning for a long, long time. Yeah, okay. It seems like you need to have really a structured process to create good learning design, yes. right? Yes. And talking a little bit more about that, if you can tell us about the tools and techniques that learning designers use to achieve their objectives, I know we can talk probably another hour. Absolutely. <laughs> related to that, <laughs> but still, it would be interesting to know, are there any new trends? Just elaborate a little bit more about that. Yeah, so, I mean, you really could have a interview on its own, like a a series of interviews about um, learning design and especially when you think about um, when you're designing learning there's a very big difference between education and training so designing content or designing learning and courses and programs for a university is very very different to designing a say like a like a health and safety course done online you know we've all done them where we sit and we have to do our you know e-learning when we first join a company there's a very very big difference and that there's lots of models out there so for example some of the universities that I work with they use the ABC uh, model learning design model and it's absolutely fabulous because it looks at all the different ranges of um, processes that a learner has to go through and and the different um, tools and techniques to get that to happen and it looks across um, like the whole entire program of learning so not just one course but you know all the modules together so is there enough opportunities for collaboration is there enough opportunities for communication feedback reflection evaluation and it helps map that out and a lecturer and in their teams to identify actually we don't do a lot of group work where what can we do to fill that hole and you know to make sure that our learners have those skills and then looking at the you know, as I was saying the sort of like training um, type of content you know there's all, all sorts of models like the ADDI model you know ways of making sure that um, when you design that 
every time you go to review your content is it doing what um you set out to do are your learners achieving first time if not do you need to change your content and all these different models the the things that straddle the both the both both of them so things like universal design for learning so this is looking at you know your learners and making sure that they are having um the information presented to them in a way that they can readily you know consume absorb understand but also giving them the opportunities to give back so for example this video interview for me is like you know really really nerve-wracking for me but if this was just an audio or a live broadcast I'd be absolutely fine and if you gave me the choice I'd say let's do a live webinar I'd be happy to talk you know so it's just giving people the choice to express their learning back to you in a way that suits them but also it could challenge them as well in a good way so lots of different things and um you know, the Moodle, Moodle Academy have run a really, really good series of webinars on learning design. So, you know, there's lots of stuff out there if people are interested. Nice, amazing. Actually, you mentioned a couple of times about Moodle, so I can't help asking you a little <laughs> bit more about that. So uh, how does Moodle allow you to support good pedagogy? Can you share from your experience? Yeah, so I have been using Moodle since 2007. So it's been a long, long time. And I have worn very hats with very, you know, very different hats with Moodle. So I've used Moodle as a student. I've used it as a, an site administrator, as a teacher. I use Moodle teaching adult education and um, BTEC diplomas. Uh, I also use Moodle as a learning technologist. So this is working in universities um, and supporting academics using it. And the tools in Moodle have always um, su supported good pedagogy. They've always, um, when Martin you know, created Moodle, it was very clear that he wanted something that teachers could use. It was more than just a virtual notice board for them to chuck up slides. You know, there's forums in there to support um, conversation and the beauty of Moodle with their forums is you can use those forums for different things forum could just be a general discussion forum or you could have a focused forum which is designed and built and scaffolded to support a particular um, learning activity so when I was working at uh, Cranfield University based at Defence Academy we had a lecturer there who used forums for um, scholarly discussions so she assigned them a couple of articles to read and they, they would have to summarise the article uh, in a forum post and then they had to then uh, respond uh, to each other's forum posts asking critical questions you know to trying to get their sort of skills of you know, written communication up to scratch, but also be able to ask the right questions. And Moodle supports just, I'm just using forums as an example, Moodle has evolved so much that you can do things like, I don't want to say force users to interact. So you can say this activity is not complete unless you've posted once and responded three times. But you, they also have now um, grading built into Moodle as well. So you can actually grade the forums. So it's it, the, Moodle has really come a long way in supporting the learning process. So whether it would be, um, like I said, conversations, so the communication side, the collaboration side, like with the wikis and other tools like the database tool. Um, you can use uh, these tools to combine learning, combine knowledge. Um, the assessment tools are incredible. But the biggest thing that supports like really good learning design is the ability to track progress. So me as a learner, I can see where I am. I have due dates. I have content that appears as and when I finish the previous one. But also as a teacher, I can go in and see, OK, my students and my learners are all following the right path or this person's a little bit behind. I can intervene and I can support. So lots of tools there in Moodle to make sure that learners know where they're going, they know how to get there and they know what happens when they get there and what happens afterwards. And that's you know, the beauty of Moodle for me. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. And before we end, I have one more question. Actually, you mentioned a couple of times learners. So I wanted to know how things look like from the learner's perspective. It seems like learning design concepts are more about learner-centered design. Am I correct? So how do you involve learners in the design process? Can you share a little bit more about that? The student feedback, some examples. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it, it depends on the situation. So, for example, uh, internally at Catalyst, we, um, like I said, I, I work with our subject matter experts to create content and we use pure um, Moodle native tools. So we use H5P, we use feedback tool, not just to give us feedback, but for reflection as well, because, you know, you can use all these tools in lots of different ways. It's amazing, um, like quizzes, assessments, stuff like that. And using um, those tools internally, we can see what, um, you know, con what, what items people regularly get wrong and we can intervene, but also the feedback is important. So we, um, as a team um, who look after all the learning, we review the feedback every year. We see what they have to say. They'll say, I really did not like that activity. It did not make sense. And then we can actually look at it and say, well, actually, maybe it doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it's part of our internal review process. So I build the course based on the subject matter. It gets reviewed by lots of different stakeholders before we actually release it to the whole company. It's very, very similar when I work with uh, my um, HE partners. So it will be either we've had feedback. This is what they want. We've had the student union have a look at it as well. This is their feedback and they'd like to see more. Um, you know, like for example, there was a lot of we need to sit down and read this and sit down and do this. Can it be a bit more active? How do we get the feedback is we'd like to be a bit more active. How can we be a bit more active? And then you'd say, well, okay, well, this is where universal design for learning comes in because those that only have 10 minutes to sit at a computer and do it can do this activity or they can actually just listen to it. So you can record a podcast version of the content. They can walk and they have a different activity to do to follow up to make sure they've understood it. So this is where the student voice and learner voices really do come in because at the end of the day, as a learning designer, we don't know everything. We are constantly learning and evolving. We learn through experience. And these are the skills that we're trying to get our learners and our students to understand as well that they learn through experience. So you have to go through something before you can improve. So the learner and student voice is really, really important. And it also makes sure that you know, if you're a good learner, if you're a good organization that really cares about your people, you are going to keep, in, you know, wanting to keep hold of them. You want to keep inspiring them. Don't just keep giving them the same old stale stuff. Refresh it. Give them new ideas. Try stuff. Be a bit brave. And if it doesn't work, fine. It doesn't work. At least you know not to do it again and just try a different way or revert back to the old way. There's lots of things that you can do to bring the learner's voice into the content. Thank you very much, Sam. It was wonderful talking to you and getting your insights on learning design. We learned a lot today. And thanks to our audience for joining us. We will be back for another video episode soon. In the meantime, you can reach out to Catalyst IT Europe and learn more about their services at catalyst.eu.net. If you would like to learn more about our partner network, visit us at moodle.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe here to our YouTube channel to catch future episodes. Thank you and see you soon.